Okay, and with that, I'll bring up our next panel session to close us out before lunch. And now we're gonna talk about the potential for national networks and how they will be used. And we have two virtual panelists and I'll ask our virtual panelists to turn their cameras on and we're gonna set up, but we've gotta make a technology um, change. I see Zach's already joined us and we just need Lynn to um, join us and I'll introduce the panelists here because we have some new faces. Okay. So first I'd like to introduce, we have an online, we have Zach Holden. We've been talking about Zach throughout the week as being one of the co-authors of uh, Topifier. And he's a research scientist who's jo um, newly joined the Rocky Mountain Research Station. We have Mark Brisberg, who's our chief meteorologist who you've been hearing from throughout the week. We have Dr. John Kalbrick. He's our research forester with the Northern Research Station and US Forest Service. And he's also a cooperating assistant professor at the School of Natural Resources at the University of Missouri. And um, we will be partnering with Missouri. And he uh, focuses his research in silviculture, forest ecology, and forest soils. Um, we have Lynn Chasen Carpenter. She's with the US Forest Service and she's our National Geologic Hazards Program Lead. She's also an experienced senior advisor and she's demonstrated a work, um, a history of working with government relations industries and her expertise has led her to have a strong interest in soil moisture relationships and landslides and management. And then we have Ian Yeslanis. Mm, there we go. And he is a research soil scientist in the Northern Research Station as well, specializing in urban forests. And um, I think that's it. That's our five panelists. Okay, so for you all in your questions, and, and this will be a little tricky because I want to make sure, do we have Lynn? I don't think we have Lynn. I don't see Lynn either. Lynn may, may have not been able to join our link and I have not heard from Lynn. Rich, were you able to contact Lynn? Okay, okay, all right. Well, we may have just missed out on our opportunity to contact with Lynn. Uh, staff, can you hear me? Uh, yes, Zach, we can hear you, thank you. I was just emailing with Lynn this morning. I, I know she was planning on being here and trying to get on, so. Okay. Well, we'll see if Lynn's able to join us. We'll add her in. Okay, I'll start, we'll start with the same format. And so the first question is in thinking about what forest soil managers need, you know, and in this case, also bringing urban into the conversation as well, urban forests. Um, how can soil moisture data be used to help managers make better management decisions? And Mark, we'll start with you. Okay. Oh, yep, yeah, opposite way. There you go. On. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I've uh, talked, I talked briefly on Tuesday about uh, how important this information was for the drought monitor, and we've heard other people mention the drought monitor as well. Um, in my history of the drought monitor, uh, just long story short, we designed the drought monitor to be a planning tool. And you hear a lot of criticism of the drought monitor as, you know, you hear these anecdotes about people saying, oh, you know, how dare you keep us in D2 or actually D3, et cetera. And, and you get that argument, but I had an OMG moment when I went to the uh, Ann Arbor meeting several years ago, and I heard about how poorly uh, the drought monitor was uh, in explaining drought in forested areas because of it's, it's a completely different ecosystem. It's not, you know, you just don't see you know, corn fire or, you know, plants wilt, there's a lot going on. And in my opinion, uh, you know, after 20 some years of the drought monitor, I could say that it is not doing a good job. Uh, so the inclusion of soil moisture information uh, and that, you know, running the gamut of what's actually going on after a fire, uh, the soil health, 
with the uh, organic material, the fuel load, et cetera. Um, I mean, I could say that this would be a first step in actually allowing people to use a product like the drought monitor to really finally uh, describe what drought is, uh, you know, what it looks like, how to put it in historical perspective based on not just, you know, six months of rainfall data, but, you know, just the accumulation and the compounding of years of uh, dryness. So, like I said, this is, this is just something that we don't have that we thought we did. Ian, talk to us about urban forest management. Urban forest. Um, so like Kathy talked about as one of the first presentations to this workshop, um, in urban areas, there is a altered water cycle, there are altered soils. It's a very fragmented landscape. Um, and with that comes a high amount of heterogeneity, right? Below ground and on the surface. And in terms of uh, an effort to collect soil moisture at the city scale, I haven't seen anything. There are lots of individual projects, and I'll talk about a couple projects, but um, there's no discussion about should we be talk should should we start a network in Baltimore? And I haven't seen that for other cities either either. Um, another thing is scale, right? So in urban environments, for us to use soil moisture data, it would have to be at a, a very fine scale. And it's very different than sort of what we've been talking about with some of these presentations at the national scale. Um, some of the things that I can see soil moisture being useful for are stormwater management, landscape and urban greening um, planning and development, uh, urban heat and ecosystem processes. And one of the examples I wanna talk about is uh, our urban forest. And this, I, we have a, a project where we are looking at um, a, lat a latitudinal study where we've collected oaks, oaks from along the Northeast coast, right? So from Springfield, Massachusetts, Hartford, Connecticut, New York, Philly, and Baltimore. And we have transplanted those oaks in different cities and different urban forests with the idea of looking at climate resilience. Well, one of the things we wanna do is we wanna relate soil moisture to the success of these particular oak species, uh, both uh, white and chestnut oak um, in these gaps. Um, another, another project we did was related to ecosystem processes and it's, it was inspired by the long-term soil productivity sites, which is a forest service network. And in Baltimore, we also had projects in Michigan and Missouri. In Baltimore, uh, we were looking at an urban rural gradient and relating soil moisture to the carbon cycle, to decomposition of these wood stakes. Um, so in terms of individual projects, soil moisture is very important. Um, we need some sort of effort to collect it citywide for it to be useful. I will say that my one of my favorite soil surveys in, in the United States is New York City because it just does not use it is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> this is what the soils are made of. So John. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, national forest needs and I, I work as a research forester I work a lot with national forest people to try it to do research that helps support their information needs. And, and here's what I'm hearing from them. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about short-term needs. So day-to-day -day types of needs that managers could use and, and really local scale. Claudia brought this up a little bit with harvesting. So she talked about the Daniel Boone National Forest, how they have some plastic soils. And when they achieve certain soil moisture levels, it becomes a real problem for them. And they, and they have to be very aware of that by if, when they have a harvest operation going on or there's any kind of equipment that needs to be used on those sites, they need that information to know when, all right, say, we got to stop, we got to wait till the soil's dry. We need to work in a different part of the forest where we don't have this problem. And there's similar issues elsewhere. And I'm going to give you a couple of concrete examples because they're a little more tangible and easy to, to grasp if you're not familiar with forestry. 
but I work with a lot of national forest folks in the lake states, think, think Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, who have been for decades accustomed to having timber sales, winter sales, where they say, okay, November 15th, they look on the calendar, November 15th, you can go in and harvest now because we have 12 inches, 14 inches, 16 inches of snowpack on the ground, which protects the soil from harvesting equipment. Well, they're finding with climate change that this is no longer the case. It may be snowpack doesn't develop until even later the winter if it does at all. So now the soil scientists on these forests are saying, whoa, we got to have this equipment out. These soils appear to be too wet to have equipment on. And the timber management officer, if you, if, if you haven't worked on a national forest, that person is responsible for getting that wood out. And they're saying, hey, I've got to get this wood out. What do you mean it's too wet? Show me it's too wet. And if we have these kinds of data available, that soil scientist feels like they have more confidence and say, look, I'll show you the information. This is why this is important. And so that, that's one, uh, you know, a, a local wise scale. So it, on the order of a timber sale, which, you know, we're talking about hundreds of acres, thousands of acres with individual sales that might be occurring in that whole unit. Um, but there's even mid and long-term examples of where this information is valuable. So uh, a colleague of mine who's the um, a regional silviculturist for the California National Forest, his name is Joe Sherlock. And we've, we've heard, a, a, you've heard in the news, of course, about the California fires. We've been talking about the California fires here. Well, Joe, as a silviculturist, is helping the forest do some replanting, reestablishing some trees and places that they've lost due to wildfire. But what he needs to know on a broader scale, so across the entire region, and what he needs to know um, and a, on a broader time scale, so months in advance, where is there existing drought that would cause planting operations to be a complete failure? Or where on these forests are there places where we can do some planting and have a, a relatively assured sort of high survival rate. So it, that's a, a, a concrete example of where soil moisture information on a broader scale is very valuable to people in national forests. Uh, we can also think about longer term needs. So uh, all national forests have a plan. We heard that the other day. And in that planning effort for national forests, since trees and forest communities are long live plants, uh, we think about our forest plans going 100 years or longer. I mean, functionally, they get replaced before that, but that's the, that's the planning window that we're thinking is decades. As a consequence, we're required to think about how climate change may affect what that forest looks like during the life of that plan or subsequent plans that we draw. And so as a, as a consequence, we need to know places like if we have Mesophytic forests currently in our national forests, where we might want to keep refugia of those in the future, if the climate, future climate doesn't support that. And there's some uncertainty with our climate estimates. So we don't know exactly. We have some ideas uh, by looking at climate projections, but we need to know where those refugia are. Currently, we can use things like the plant available water holding capacity of the soil that we can get from the soil survey. Very insightful. But if we get additional information about what's actually happening with the soil and the water storage in it, that's even better. That's a, like the, that's a, a much more clear and uh, more useful piece of information for us to use. Um, we, we heard uh, from Ben Rowell's presentation and saw, if you were paying attention to some of his figures, there, there's some localized topographic effects that redistribute grav gravitational water and, and, and feed lower parts of the landscape longer than upper parts of the landscape. So it's more than just the water holding capacity of the soil itself, but it's also how that water is being redistributed in the landscape. And that's where the actual soil measurements can help us understand those kinds of things. So those are just a couple of examples, concrete examples of, of how managers really need this information. Thank you, John. Okay, now we'll go to our virtual panelists. Um, and Lynn, it looks like we got you. Thank you so much for joining us. So I'll start with Lynn and then we'll go to Zach. So go ahead, Lynn, is your volume on? Yes, can you hear me? Okay, and the question was, in thinking about your area of expertise, 
how can soil data be used to help managers make better management decisions? And I know that you've been thinking long about this with landslides and geohazards. So tell us, tell us about this aspect of soil moisture monitoring. Yes. Yeah, so one of the things that we've noticed with uh, landslides and in particular shallow landslides is that they are very sensitive to soil moisture levels and especially porosity uh, um, strengths. And so one of the things that we're also seeing is with climate change is we're seeing more extreme events. And by extreme, I mean beyond the two standard deviations. As the climate warms, the atmosphere is basically becoming unstable. And also uh, for every degree of uh, Celsius that the, temp the overall atmosphere warms, we can have, we had, I think it's 7% more um, moisture. So we have more extreme events with more extreme rainfall events, especially, but also more extreme snowfall events, since we have rain on snow events, rain on snow uh, uh, flooding events, which trigger landslides as well. So one of the things that um, that's been going on for many years, for decades, is looking at how does soil moisture predict or the antecedent mo soil moisture affect the uh, susceptibility to landslides. And so one of the problems, though, is we don't have very good uh, soil moisture networks across a wide variety of terrains, um, as slope aspects, um, environments, elevations. And so increasing our network of soil moisture monitors will really help us understand better when we should be really uh, watching out for soil moisture and rain event triggered landslides. And so one of the things that I, I made a couple of slides and I'm, I apologize, I was late this morning. Um, but one of the things we're also seeing is with this increase in climate variability and extreme events is that we'll have one event, like the classic example is the Maria, the Irma Maria uh, kind of two, so Irma went across Puerto Rico about 10 days before Maria. Irma was a stronger, uh, Okay, we just lost your we just lost your audio, Lynn. And it could be a technical issue on our side. We'll we'll figure that out here in a minute. The the Maria. Yes, you good? Oh yeah, we're good. Okay, good. Yes. Yeah, so what we saw with the Irma Maria two uh, two hurricanes is that uh, the first one saturated the soils. And then it didn't take that much from the second one, even though Maria, Maria was a direct hit, it was a category three, but um, that because the soils were already saturated, it caused thousands of landslides across Puerto Rico. So one of the things that I would like to see with soil moisture networks is being able to monitor how um, our soils uh, react to precipitation events and then being aware when we have saturated soils, so we've had future climate events or you know, extreme or even regular precipitation events in the future, we can be aware and maybe um, let people be on alert for uh, potential landslides and flooding. The other thing is what we're working on with some other, with the emergency management office is trying to tie in the soil moisture monitor network with, um, with potentially early warning systems for things like debris flow. Now debris flows are not typically um, uh, exacerbated by early uh, and antecedent soil moisture. Now, shallow landslides are, but debris flows are not. It's very interesting and in the in the big picture. Deep seated landslides are also. But one of the things that we can look at with um, early warning systems is knowing when we are having saturated conditions uh, from from rain events. And so we have a, a soil moisture monitor in combination with things like a rain um, rain collection, you know, rain sensors. I can't. I'm thinking straight this morning, um, but uh, and and also combining that with snow tell, so we understand the amount of snowpack as well. So because snowpack also greatly affects the amount of soil moisture, and actually is, it gives some a little bit of protective effect on um, on shallow landslides. If we have a snowpack on um, a land on a slope when you have a rain event, it has a kind of a double whammy though, because it protects from the soil moisture being antecedently high, but it also can create a rain or snow events. And so understanding um, and looking at historical occurrences where maybe we had snow on the ground and it rained and we didn't have a rain or snow event, where in other cases we did, 
what's the difference? How does the soil moisture and acidic soil moisture make a difference or does it make a difference? And then how do we tie these into early warning systems for both flooding and landslides is um, some of the things that I would really be interested in um, going in the future. Thanks, Lynn. Okay, and Zach, take us take us to uh, your area of expertise with fire and all the work you've been doing with Region One and the, what they've been asking of you lately. Okay, <clears throat> sure. Thanks. Can you can you hear me? Okay, Stephanie. Okay, yes, thanks. Thanks, thanks for having me. I'm sorry I'm not there. This seems like a really great meeting. Um, yeah. So I mean, traditionally we don't really use soil moisture in in fire management. Um, you know, we have an old model, the Keech Byram Drought Index that was developed in the 60s for the Eastern United States. But that model is so simple that it doesn't have a lot of utility in the, in the Western United States. So we, we just don't really use it that much um, in, in fire management. This has been a really interesting year though um, in, the, in the Northern Rockies. We have a new, um, a new group, a new staff group in the fire and aviation management group in region one. We're a little more dynamic. Um, and, and, and engaged. And they've been, you know, they've been using the, um, the drop monitoring tool that was developed at the University of Montana and looking at a lot of different soil moisture products, including the, the data sets that we generate on Topo Fire and actually considering soil moisture for the, for the first time. Um, and so, you know, this got me excited. I got really engaged and, and kind of over the summer, I've been training models basically to predict potential for fire spread or rate of growth um, using reconstructions of old satellite data and the corresponding weather and soil moisture. And you know what we're finding through this process is that the soil moisture anomalies are incredibly predictive for, for fire. Um, they are gaining this kind of qualitative understanding of what these maps mean. We have this dynamic interplay where I'll make little changes. It's really, really exciting. And so I, I feel like moving forward, at least for the next couple of years in this region and maybe in the Northwest, we are gonna actually start using soil moisture to kind of evaluate um, conditions. Uh, the, the motivation for this, this work really was um, prescribed fires actually. And we had a report come out in our agency um, just a year or so ago highlighting that some of our recent escape pre prescribed fires may have been you know, associated with drop that we didn't really consider. So antecedent moisture essentially. And, and we started there, but um, I, I feel like through this process, we're pretty quickly going to come up with some simple tools to, to help with that question of, you know, hey, can I start a fire now? Are my conditions, you know, suitably wet where I won't get an escape? So I, I, I'm really excited about where we're going there. Um, you know, at the national level, our real expert for you know, anything related to fire danger and fire management is Matt, Matt Jolly. He manages the wildland fire assessment system, WIMS, all of our national programs. And, um, you know, he recognized long ago the limitations of the KBDI. He redesigned the national fire danger rating system over the last couple of years and very astutely kept KBDI in there as a placeholder, knowing that we would eventually get a better soil moisture model to fit in there. And what he's doing now is taking the topo fire model, just a simple, simple water balance model. He's coding that into C++, putting, into the, putting that into the NFDRS. And so pretty soon we're gonna have a national map um, you know, of, of a kind of a plausible soil moisture model that'll be integrated into our our national system. So that's, I think, the really exciting kind of kind of national scale work that's that's happening for fire right now. Um, so I'll, I'll I'll stop there and, and we can maybe discuss more through the through the questions. Thanks, Zach. I appreciate that. And we've got some online comments too coming in. Um, and let's see, we've. I'm trying, let's see, I'm going to, Mike, show me just how to do this. We've got Brent Duncan. He's got some drought and forest might be better conveyed as a wildfire potential. Uh, seems necessary to be able to relate urban soil moisture to stormwater infrastructure, especially with uh, so much impervious surface and disturbance and likely very small percentage of natural soils. That's a really good comment for that. Um, and avalanches, also looking at avalanches and, so and management. And um, so, and putting some tools there together to, for monitoring. So with that, does anybody want to reflect back? Mark, I thought you might have had a reflection there. I saw you when um, Zach talked about drought that you might have had a reflection back. And then and then we and Zach kind of opened up the door for us to talk about the next question, which is, well, what kind of tools do we have now that we can use today? And what kind of tools do we need to be working on 
in the future to answer these management questions? Well, my, my reaction to uh, Zach, uh, I, Stephanie saw me writing that down. I'm going to check out that Montana drought monitor and see exactly how they incorporate soil moisture into that because the drought monitor authors do use soil moisture products they would like they would like to use in situ observations more and um so i, I just want to see what that looks like the comment online about maybe wildfire uh potential would be uh something that maybe be reflected uh as an indicator of how dry it is we did that at, at the at the onset of the drought monitor. We used to have like a, a a category for fire, but we took that out because we figured that um, at some point fire wasn't uh, an indicator of drought. It was a result of drought, and especially in a forested area, um, you know. I just what I was just talking about a couple of minutes ago. You know, are we really giving people a product that is telling them what they can expect every 10 years, every 50 years, every 100 years, because that's what the drought monitor was. So I, I do like the idea of tying, or at least trying to tie the drought monitor with uh, forest fire potential. But again, that's more of an, it's more of an impact than uh, a cause of drought. But again, they're, they're obviously the two walk hand in hand. So, you know, that's why it's not on the drought monitor. Did you guys? Yeah. Ian, do you want to talk about infrastructure in urban forests and uh, impervious services? Yeah, so to, to address that um, online comment, um, so soils in urban areas have to hyperfunction to some degree, right? Um, Kathy Slavics from Hopkins, Sue Schwartz from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, we're doing a small study looking at, we're characterizing um, the water, the, the, the soil water characteristics. We're looking at uh, uh, KSAT, we're looking at saturated hydraulic conductivity, we're looking at uh, um, unsaturated flow, we're looking at infiltration, and we're looking at different land uses. And the land uses we chose were uh, parks that are throughout the city, forest patches, and then these vacant lots, these heterogeneous vacant lots that are very different and can't be characterized just by looking at the surface of the soil. They're very different in terms of um, how they were constructed, uh, when they were constructed. Um, so there's lots of variability. And we, and, we, and we would like to relate soil moisture to some of the functions of these soils in terms of um, hydraulic conductivity and stormwater management. And if we could link soil moisture to um, some of these other relevant data, I think there is an opportunity to create decision support models that would help locate stormwater management practices and green spaces. Excellent, thank you. Lynn, do you wanna talk a little bit about avalanches? And, ge and the geohazard risk with avalanches? So my understanding, and, and there's not a lot of, at least that I'm, not, that I'm aware of, of uh, looking at soil moisture below snowpacks as far as avalanche potential. I do know that um, there've been several studies looking at how soil moisture uh, related to landsliding is actually decreased once you get a snowpack on a slope. Um, it seems to have some a moderating effect on the soil moisture. I'm not sure if it's because per, per, potentially because uh, presumably the snowpack is frozen, therefore there's not much water going into the soil. I'm not sure. Um, but I do know that, of course, once we get to spring thaw, then oftentimes um, a lot of the, you know, the snowpack is slowly, um, slowly or fast, depending on the weather, uh, melting into the soil. And I do know that some cases that avalanches are triggered because the underlying soil below the snowpack fails and that triggers the overall avalanche. Now, as far as um, how so most of the time, 
and, and the Forest Service, uh, we have a separate avalanche center. I don't technically deal with avalanches as a geologic hazard, although I believe they are because um, ice is a mineral, so therefore it would be a geologic hazard. But we do have a, a robust um, monitoring system for avalanche and, and also assessing avalanche dangers. So as far as from the geologic hazard perspective, we have a pretty good handle on uh, letting people know who are going to go recreate in the backcountry when um, the conditions are right for avalanches. So, um, I, I, but I do know also that the, the soil moisture below snowpacks can definitely have an effect on increasing the susceptibility to lamp avalanches, and particularly in the springtime thaw. Okay, excellent. Thanks, Lynn. I'm going to go back to a, a comment here online about soil moisture. Um, soil moisture, and this is, I think this is from Devonder. Let's see here. Soil moisture data e is equally important as, a, as another parameter for forest road culvert vulnerability using hydrologic, I have to read here, hydrologic, and hydrogeomorphologic risks as an assessment tool. John, can you talk a little bit about this? And the reason why, this is, this is close to home for me. When we have large scale events like hurricanes come through national forests and we get what they call ERFO funds, or emergency forest um, federal. I know. I know. It's, 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 um, it's, yes, it's federal. Uh, it's federal, federal, federal. Road. Yeah, federally owned yes. roads. Yes, federal roads. And we are allowed then to get, we get funding as an emergency response. And they come in and they say on national forest lands, you can replace those culverts. Here's funding to do that. And we say, okay, we know the system's changing we know, oh, no, wait, that was only a 24 inch culvert. You can only replace it with a 24 inch culvert. And then what happens is we have another system come through and your federal taxpayer dollars, then my federal taxpayer dollars wash away again. So John, can you talk to us a little bit about culverts and soil moisture and uh, our yeah. federal road system? Yeah, I'll do that. Uh, it's interesting because uh, so a lot of our forests follow best management practices that give recommendations on, yes. on how to size culverts, where to put them, because most of our issues are associated with forest roads and trails that are removing timber. So all these specifications are in tables for us to use. And of course, they are designed for the climate that we had at the time That's when right. they were developed. So so that's a moving target. And then, and now let's add the soil moisture uh, component to that. So now, now as, let's say you have a soil in September in say the Eastern United States in a forest there where, it, where now it's fairly dry. It's getting, you know, not maybe close to the wilting point, may, maybe not right there. Uh, a big storm comes along, it has a great capacity to absorb a lot of that water and you may not think it's an issue. But if we start having a series of events where that soil becomes saturated now, now that water will run off. There is no capacity for it to go into the soil. And so that's going to change all the calculations and the specs for, for roads. So it, it's something we think about a lot increasingly. Yeah. And it's, and now you're talking about some of the challenges that we brought out earlier in our talk, in our openings today, scale. A culvert is a point on the ground and the influence of that watershed influencing that one particular culvert, you know, how that's in a direct measurement or a direct series of measurements in a small watershed. You know, these are some of the problems that forests face when looking at trying to deal with that. Okay. Um, does any other, the other panelists want to add anything reflecting on anybody else's comments before I move on? Because go ahead, Lynn. You're on mute. Let's get you off mute first here. There we there go. Uh, I did that. I wanted to add to the culvert conversation as well. A couple of things about the culvert system. Um, um, because we, um, we, I wouldn't say often, but we do build new roads when we have timber sales. Um, and what we do when we build new roads across slopes is we end up concentrating the flow from like a dispersed flow down, down the side of a hill to disperse to a point. And then we, we basically, um, concentrate that flow to one specific point. So culverts are a common location for the triggering of landslides. Roads are also triggering for landslides. And so when you combine that with our increasing climate and the increasing propensity for our soils to become saturated as was mentioned before, and then have a subsequent storm uh, that basically um, starts sheet flow. And then we have, uh, we overwhelm our culverts and cause, uh, can be devastating effects with flooding. 
and flooding and landslides really go hand in hand. So I just wanted to comment on that. And then the ERFO, one of the problems with ERFO that I've seen, and I'm not sure if this is still true or, or was true, that oftentimes when, when we repair a road using the emergency federally owned roads funding source that's, that's provided by the Department of Transportation, is that if that same culvert becomes overwhelmed two years later after we repaired it and we had to under, you know, put an underserving culvert in that spot, is they're less likely to provide funding to repair it again because they're basically like, well, you've already fixed it once. Why are we spending money on the second time? So it's kind of a it's kind of a double whammy where we're not able to look um, into the future and looking at how climate change affects how um, rainfall and how our new dynamic of uh, the climate is affecting the, the basically effectively the soil moisture and how this once the soil gets saturated it causes um, increased runoff um, we are kind of being ha hampered by the, the just you know the con the the older thought processes that where these these systems were put these programs are put into place you know 20 or 30 years ago when we didn't have these we didn't have the climate changing climate and if you replace the culvert, it should have functioned well. Now it, that's not necessarily the case. So it's kind of a it's a snowballing effect with how climate's changing, how we are having um, these more extreme events and more one two climate events that are uh, really really challenging our infrastructure across the Forest yes. Service. Yes, and costing lots of money. So um, thank you. So I have one more question for the panelists. We've got about twenty minutes left. And I want and, and I want to make sure we allow adequate time for questions. So my my this kind of brings us in again, pushing us into the future. If you could have a wish list for a tool, does it exist today? And if it doesn't exist, what would be your wish list for that tool? And Zach, I'm going to start with you. Oh boy, um, <laughs> I, I I mean I I don't know I'm I'm. From the fire perspective, I'm more kind of, I guess, optimistic about being able to actually affect changes in our fire management systems than I ever have been. Um, because we have this incredible convergence now of, you know, good data sets, big computers, good models. I mean, we have, I think, what we need to make really useful, useful spatial information. Um, I think what I'd like to see, you know, our group or others develop is a system where whenever we have a new fire you know a new a new ignition we immediately start building all of the kind of highest quality spatial information that we can you know from the hydrologic condition the soil moisture vegetation stress you know run wind engine simulations build everything we need to basically rapidly run fire spread models and get an initial assessment based on all of those conditions that we've gathered of what that fire is going to do and um, that in my mind is just a kind of a critical piece for making those initial decisions and potentially moving towards, you know, managing fires under favorable, favorable conditions um, rather than just sort of instinctively suppressing everything. So okay. that's my dream tool. Okay. Ian, what's your dream tool for urban forests? Or does it exist? Or, or for the urban environment and urban forests? Um, so I think I mentioned it, this, this idea of a decision support tool, mm -hmm. right? So integrating soil moisture with lots of other things like infrastructure and some sort of function of soils and being able to make decisions on the ground about uh, where is the best place to plant trees in order to deal with urban heat? Where's the best place to put stormwater management retention areas? Um, what forest patches, there's lots of, lots of small forest patches throughout Baltimore City. There's a large one in the Gwens Falls, Leakin Park, but in general, they're small and cumulatively, mm -hmm. they have a huge effect. Mm -hmm. And so how do we protect those and how do we show the effect of these forest patches on a variety of ecosystem services related to, to heat, to uh, well-being, mm -hmm. um, sort there's of the of social, social interaction in terms of stewardship, I mean, I, I think the research is out there uh, to some degree, and we need more uh, an integrated system to sort of take that research and, and uh, allow decision makers to make decisions. Nice. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Mark, how about you? 
I've got big ideas. Um, I, what I think would be cool, and I don't know how close we are to doing this. I know that we've got puzzle pieces available, but I was telling somebody uh, the other day, it might've been you, Stephanie, I can't remember. Um, I'm always giving everybody my ideas. Um, I would like to see a product that would be a companion with the drought monitor taking information maybe from NAS or from the state, uh, you know, departments of agriculture. I'd like to see some type of product, regional, national, that would show a wilting point. So you could get soil moisture to actually say, yes, these crops are in trouble. Now to take that one step further, when I saw the picture of that tree soil moisture probe, I was like, wow. Can we do that to see, you know, how how uh, the trees are suffering under drought? I mean, we could see you can drive by a corn crop or soybeans and see them wilting, but you don't know if a tree is sick until it starts to drop leaves. So that would be my perfect tool. Um, go out and do it. Excellent. Okay, let's go. Let's go down to John. It's maybe a little bit similar to Mark's and, and Russ Briggs talked about this this morning too, but my dream tool is to be able to go to web soil survey or soil web or whatever, and click on a map unit and, and you'll see all the different component soils that are in that map unit. There's variation yeah. and that's one way they display that variation, but to click on that and get real time estimates of what the soil moisture levels are. Right. So that right. to me, that's ideal. Um, and I think, I think we can get there because we are have been talking about in the last few days about models for making estimates. We've got a lot of NASA to link it. here. We're talking about, about some uh, satellite remote imaging, things like that, that can help do that. So yeah. that's my dream tool. And I think managers would love it. And I think they would too. Along the lines that Tyson talked about yesterday was that would help make drought and soil moisture be part of our everyday language. Uh, not just with managers, but even the public, they would get it too, right? So, um, Lynn, what's your dream tool? My dream tool would be honestly an early warning system for uh, for flooding and landsliding, with you utilizing and incorporating, and actually really relying heavily on the soil moisture uh, network, understanding where our high hazard zones would be. Um, before we had a second precipitation event, I'm kind of anticipating it, this would be one of the one, two precipitation events, uh, collaborating with the National Weather Service to help with uh, warnings. We do have, they do provide flood warnings currently based on uh, hydrologic modeling, but we don't have like landsliding and mud flow predictive, or at least um, like we don't have hazard zones identified yet. And so, I, but I think we can get there and one of the challenges to that right now, of course, is that in our high hazard areas, which tend to be mountainous, is we don't have a robust soil moisture monitoring network or raw stations or snowtail stations. So, um, and I was just actually talking to the snowtail, the lady who works um, is the director for the snowtail um, part of the uh, NRCS. And, and I was asking her, how can we increase the number of snowtail stations in adjacent to raw stations with you know, with the soil moisture. So we have the entire climate um, capture, data capture tools. And so we're working kind of in tandem with the NRCS on trying to increase the our data tool, collection tools across. And especially, and I would pick some of the, you know, for the first implementation of these um, tools would be some of our high hazard areas. The biggest problem is that often those are wilderness areas adjacent to transportation corridors or above transportation corridors. And that Wilderness areas can be really difficult to install um, new technology or new stations of any kind. So, thanks, Lynn. Okay, let's open it up to our audience, both our online virtual audience and our. Okay, we got lots of questions. All right. Okay, well, go ahead. Big thanks to the panel. So, my question is thinking about a lot of these dream tools. Um, I feel like there's a need for a unified soil moisture metric because volumetric water content is not going to be the same for different soil types, whether you're talking about wilting point or fire risk or anything like that. And so I'd love to hear the panel's thoughts on what unit would be most useful to them as they're thinking about these things. Uh, 
Dr. Anya Wente. I could say something real quick, but basically one of the things that triggers landslides is the poor pressure. I don't know if that, how that relates to um, plant viability or, you know, plant stress, but for us, it's poor pressure. When we, our poor pressure rises, it basically forces the grains to part. And so instead of having grain to grain contact, you have water between, and then there's no shear stress and that's when it fails. Okay, John. Yeah, and I don't, we probably couldn't all agree on a single measurement, but I think for managers and for applications that I'm most familiar with, if we had some estimate of, of what the volumetric water content was and what percentage of uh, the total plant available, I think would be pretty useful for a lot of applications. And moisture is important, right? But um, I, I believe texture is is equally as important. And I think doing some pedotransfer function related to moisture and texture and getting sort of the soil water curve um, is important for a variety of things, right? C comparing 20% in sand, which is field capacity to 20% in clay, which is a wilting point, doesn't tell you anything, right? Until you have that texture. Mm -hmm. um, so this project that we're doing uh, across the Northeast, looking at the regeneration of these forests, a, a lot of it has to do with, we're looking at volumetric moisture, but we need texture. We need to say, what, what, or how close are we approaching this wilting point? And when do we need to irrigate to get them you know, through those first two years of drought or isolated drought, not drought like you would consider in the West, but for the East, you know, they're, could get a month of no rain. And so that's important. And I think tying texture to uh, moisture is, is extremely important. Zach, do you have anything on this one for us? Oh, you're on mute too. Okay. Not yet. Sorry, there Stephanie, I was muted. I, I really don't have anything to add. Thanks though. Okay, all right. Let's take another question. Oh yeah. And then I'm gonna go to Dave Hoover. Just real quick, that's uh, developing products. You you sort of reminded me when you were talking about you know modeling irrigation uh, timings. That's uh, where a strong partnership with the private sector comes into play because they they are driven by the economics of trying to solve problems like that. So again, it's might not be solved by people in this room, but you know by people who are used to developing tools to help other people make management decisions. Dave Hoover had, I wanna to go to Dave Hoover here with a question. Just so wanted to address a couple of the comments that I heard. One, I, I, I like to be able to uh, fulfill people's dreams <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> Dave, tell tell our virtual audience who you are, so everybody makes sure. I'm David Hoover. I'm the director of the National Soil Survey Center for NRCS. <laughs> our wish provider for our web soil survey. So, John, I I, I hear you, and, and I think uh, as you've heard, our and it's been mentioned a couple times here, our dynamic soil survey is that information source that we're planning on to have for soils information, not instead of just the the base information and soils published soil surveys but to have that uh, effects of management and climate on those soils and how they will react uh, in a dynamic manner. So we're, we're, we're with you and we'd love to partner more with, with you all on that. Yeah, and I'm, I just wanna say kudos to you because I, I know you guys are on board with that and you're thinking that way and I think that's really wonderful. And then Ian on the, uh, on the urban side, so we do conduct urban soil surveys we have them in several major cities right now and are continuing to do that. And if we know ahead of time what data may be needed to collect out there that we're not collecting under traditional soil survey methods, and definitely urban surveys are not, soil surveys are not traditional. Uh, we'd love to work there, but got your information. I'm gonna turn it over to our, uh, our uh, urban soil coordinator, soil mapping coordinator and we'll see what we're doing there. Uh, and just a note, we are establishing a new soil order for yes. uh, those of you that dig soil taxonomy. 
uh, and may have studied it in, in the past, there's going to be a whole new soil order called artisols that will be the uh, human uh, um, transported human activity yeah. uh, type soils that are yeah. out there. A few pathology professors that are very excited about that. <laughs> yeah, we'll go. Yeah, we'll go back and then we'll come around this way. Sorry about that, John. Hey everyone, Jonathan Case, uh, NASA, NASA Sports Center in Huntsville, Alabama. And this is addressing Mark's uh, dream product here. While it's not a direct soil moisture measurement, uh, Chris Hain, our project manager, he's been working with Martha Anderson's team for a while with the evaporative stress index product. And it's like Alexi, Alexi, Disalexi, and it's looking at the change in land surface temperatures from the satellite in clear scenes. And his standardized anomaly product in ESI will infer a vegetation stress prior to it actually showing up in the NDVI signals. And that's a global five kilometer product. And of course, I'm not sure about how translatable to higher resolutions that is, but that's the current status of the product. And Jonathan and I are going to work on a ROS project uh, together. So I'm very excited about that proposal forthcoming with NASA. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, I, I have a possible solution um, getting back to the volumetric water content question. So, and that this is specific to the water supply community and flooding and so forth. People just interested in the in that soil pour as a reservoir. Um, we the Snowtail office in Salt Lake publishes about sixteen reports a year, and we we publish basinized um, soil moisture. And to do that, um, we normalize to saturation. So that's how we deal with the the super clay stuff and the flagstaff formation, the soils there and, and the super sandy stuff in the Wasatch formation derived soils. And so we have a huge variety of textures. It's super, super important in, a, in the West, especially to, to be able to yeah, capture the fact that these are different, different soil types. So you, you're not getting the permanent wilting point and we're not normalizing you know, field capacity or anything, but normalizing to saturation has been a pretty fantastic tool and, it, and an easy way to distill it down so that the, the press <laughs> can uh, ingest it and understand it and add it to their stories and, that, and it's worked. So one idea. We have about five minutes left for questions. Oh yeah, this is a question for Zach. So in relation to Stephanie's uh, request for future tools, uh, for your top of fire, would uh, remote sensing based high resolution soil moisture be useful and needed? If so, what would be your desired specifications? For example, the capabilities include anywhere from six to 200 meter resolution from surface to upper root zone, and the accuracy of around 6%. Would any of these help your future capabilities? I, you know, I, I don't have a lot of expertise uh, in the area of remotely sensing soil moisture, honestly. So I, I, I haven't looked carefully at, at a lot of those products or thought honestly about how they, they might be useful. Um, you know, our, our colleagues at the University of Montana, Kelsey Jenkso and, um, and Zach Hoylman have been assessing the accuracy a lot of, of a lot of the SMAP and other satellite based products and, and finding that they're, you know, reasonably useful for very, um, you know, very kind of shallow soil surfaces, you know, soil moisture near the surface. But of course, that capacity diminishes as you go deeper. And I, I feel like for fire, where we're ultimately going to end up. Um, you know, is, is trying to connect soil moisture deficits to plant hydraulic stress and leaf relative water content. I mean, I, I think that's really what's, what's kind of driving that connection between soil moisture and fire. And to do that, we, we're going to have to have that deeper soil moisture data. We're going to have to understand really how much stress that tree is under that's accessing water from much deeper in the ground. 
so so just to be honest i i you know i haven't i haven't put a lot of um yeah stock in the in the in the satellite based products if something much better and higher resolution came along we would definitely um look at it though excellent okay well let's go to ben and then we'll go to now Yeah, I don't know if this is such a, so much a question as a comment and, and maybe a, a, a request, you know, is when I started thinking about the products that our, our constituents would want, uh, you know, within the poor soil science community, and I started coming up with my own dreams about if I were king for a day, what this would look like. Uh, and had this really elaborate, you know, dashboard, you know, that would be available. And I was really excited about it. And it was going to cost millions of dollars to produce. Uh, and then I got to talk with the folks that are working on the dynamic soil survey. That's a pretty small group. Uh, but when I started talking to them, I was like, oh, wait, your vision is kind of similar to what my vision was, right? And so the one, uh, the one thing I just want to stress and emphasize, you know, is we're, there's a whole bunch of us in this room. Uh, who come from different organizations and have different technologies available to them. And if we all keep moving, and it's great that we're all following and, and pursuing individual lines of research, uh, but I think one of the things I worry about at some point in time is that we pursue these individual lines of research that start diverging. We're creating our own products, our own dashboards. You know, essentially the zone is like completely flooded with stuff and people don't know where to turn to get it. You know, it becomes anomalous or whatever. Uh, you know, and, and it's so maybe is there is there any way we can focus, you know, our efforts and say, okay, there is there is ultimately a one stop shop repository for all this information. And I don't want to say it's it's a dynamic soil survey because maybe that's a product that's 20 years away, but uh, but maybe that is the, the end product. Um, you know, so just just can we maybe just kind of plant that idea in our heads and, and think about where where all this goes in the in the end. Thanks, Ben. You could have easily sat on this panel up here with us with your expertise for sure. Um, no, we'll go to Noah and then we'll wrap up wrap it up with a thank you to our panelists. Hi, thank you, everyone. Um, I am coming from a slightly different world than the long-term soil moisture monitoring networks. Um, I'm coming from years of working for the National Park Service, doing a variety of different monitoring activities. And um, in that context, there's often a lot of emergent needs that need to be addressed quickly for um, measuring, for example, emerging water quality issues, um, for fire, having mobile air quality stations, that kind of thing. So my question is, um, especially for the folks doing natural hazards, firework, um, is it, does it make any sense or would it be at all helpful to have some sort of cheaper, more mobile soil moisture sensing um, uh, units that you could deploy at, as needed. So like if you have an emerging natural hazard situation that you wanna monitor in a, in a specific location, being able to deploy a low cost soil moisture sensor there. Um, so that, yeah, generally that's my question. And, and um, additionally, like being able to deploy things like in wilderness areas and that kind of stuff where you have a lot of issues about uh, land disturbance, et cetera. Any one of you, go ahead, John. Go ahead. So I guess in uh, regard to your question about, you know, are, are there less expensive methods that you could apply to, to get specific information about your, the park maybe you're working in or something like that? Is that fair? I'd, I would say, yeah, absolutely. Um, we measure soil moisture in a lot of different ways. And some of the instrumentation that we use is, is pretty inexpensive. You know, Decagon makes a bunch of wafers that uh, give you reasonable information as, as long as the level of precision that you require is not so precise that uh, that you need the best equipment to get it. I think that's perfectly fine. And it might really help you make decisions in the park about other other activities that you're going to do, other management that you do. So, yes. And Lynn has a response as well. Yeah. So from the from the natural hazards and and of course, Park Service and Forest Service have similar, but not identical mandates, right? So um, one of the things that's the difference is that the recreation, that like, the use of people per square mile is much higher for Park Service than it is for Forest Service. But my, what I would, I think if I was gonna use, use a, like a portable field unit, it would be for a, like a known, for example, a known landslide. 
um, that's maybe above something that we care about and that, you know, whatever, some kind of infrastructure, some kind of access, fire access, whatever it is. And I would use that probably to look at the change in the conditions. I wouldn't probably use it to look at absolute, you know, values. First of all, the second thing I would comment on is, especially in forest service and probably also in a lot of the park service units is that um, you'd have to be in the field because a lot of times we don't have remote, like you'd have to have satellite communication and that, that obviously raises your cost. So if you're going to leave a probe or more multiple probes in a landslide, for example, if we're monitoring the landslide soil moisture as well as movement, um, we'd have some have to have some sort of uplink to um, potentially cell service, often not the case with uh, remote areas, but probably satellite service. So that raises the cost, but it, I mean, absolutely we could, I mean, I, I've approached, um, we have a couple of problematic landslides on some of the forests, especially up in Montana, where we're looking at doing some temporary applications of both um, soil moisture monitors with the region there, and also looking at some um, across the valley, looking at some like basically radar or LIDAR effect, effectively LIDAR. So we watch the movement because it actually it's about private residents. We wanna make sure we can get them out in time. So that's my personal experience with those types of field, inexpensive field units. Right. Thank you, Lynn. And Mark, we'll let you have the last word. Yeah, thanks. Uh, real quick, I think that's an excellent idea. Um, I personally would like to see, um, you know, uh, national parks, uh, forest service land, et cetera. I would like to see the, the folks who work there become citizen scientists and be able to have something inexpensive, but where people could take readings, they could replace batteries in an area where there's no, you know, they're under canopy. Um, my, my dream recommendation a couple of years ago was for all of the USDA FSA and RMA offices to be cocoa observers. Um, still waiting on that. But like I said, I, I have big ideas and nobody else does it. I think that's an excellent idea. And, and I think it behooves the federal and state governments to uh, have some skin in the game. Excellent. Thank you. Well, thank you panelists for enticing these questions and thank you audience for um, trying out our panel discussions in this part of our workshop this week. I hope you found that valuable as opposed to the PowerPoint presentations and the discussions a little bit different. We're going to break for lunch, be back at 10 till one, and we will start with a modeling session in the afternoon and then wrap up our day with some discussions about how to take our forest soil moisture monitoring into a framework. What kind of products do we have? What kind of publications should we be pursuing? And who of you would like to be part of that? So thank you.